Um, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to speak. And uh, I just want to say, of course, that our work in new managerialism is with two colleagues, um, Bernie Grommel from Minut and Dimna Devine. So I firmly believe that most of our academic scholarship we do not produce on our own, and it is a lie to pretend we do. So I just want to make that clear. Most of us benefit greatly from the input and cooperation of colleagues, including even those whose names are not on the books. So I'm going to talk about new managerialism today. Um, could I hold this in my hand, I wonder? Could I? Is that possible? Yeah, that's better, if you don't mind. And I feel I can walk around. I'm not tight at standing in one spot. Um, um, basically, I suppose the context of this is uh, research we did, I should say, for this book, uh, which was funded by the Department of Education and Science, the Gender Equality Unit. Um, it was a study of senior managers, uh, people who were appointed to senior posts at primary, second level, and higher education. And we, we analysed the posts and how they were constructed, uh, what the criteria were for appointment, the process of appointment, and then we interviewed a selected number of people who had been recently appointed, that is in the last five years, about their whole experience of management uh, in Irish education, obviously it was in the South. So I'm just saying that's the context and it's based on those interviews, the background analysis, etc. that I'm speaking uh, today. Uh, obviously, uh, I'm going to talk about, and begin to talk about neoliberalism and as a political ideology because I think it's very important to situate what we're saying in the context of politics. Because uh, education is always political. As Paulo Freire said, it's either for domestication or for freedom. It is uh, untruthful to pretend it can be depoliticized. I will talk about why neoliberalism now. Why has it had such impact and why is it uh, so overwhelming in many areas of public life? I will talk about its impact and values. And then, what I suppose the core of what I'm talking as an organisational form, humanitarianism as an organisational form and how it is reconstituting education and its impact on equality and the issue of carelessness. I think it's very important to define it because actually a lot of people talk about neoliberalism, they never define it. And I think one of the best definitions is uh, David Harvey's definition. And I think it's very significant because it is about this idea that the individual can be liberated uh, by strong, uh, within uh, bringing out their freedom and human capability by developing an entrepreneurial culture and by ensuring strong private property rights, free markets and free trade. So the goal is actually at that macro level is the role of the state is to create an environment where this kind of institutional culture can be realised. And of course the state intervention in facilitating that is desired but once it has facilitated, the state is seen to be, to be kept in a, at a bare minimum in terms of influence. And I think that's very important for public education because that ideology is not often articulated and anyone who's in the South knows there's a current debate going on because our president referred to this lately in, in the South and people are very exercised about it. But I think many of the people who write it and contradict it actually don't know what neoliberalism is. And if those who have read Harvey's book would certainly know its origins uh, in the Chicago School of Economics in the 1970s. And I think the, the reason I think it matters so much because it is a different concept of the citizen. It is not the idea of the citizen as a person with rights, but it is a market view of the citizen. And it presumes, I think, that the relationship to the state will change, and that citizens' relation to the state is mediated via the market. That is a fundamental redefinition of the nature of what it is to be a citizen in a democratic state. You are redefined as customers, and when we say that, people say, where is the evidence? Well, I'd say to you, only look at our own Department of Education website. It is a whole section of our customers that you are a customer. We have fought it, won it sometimes in the universities, at least in higher education colleges in the South, not to have that language used in, in a lot of colleges, but in a lot of colleges it is used. And we get emails from customer care and customer services in IT, etc. So there is a redefining. And I suppose what I feel so strongly about is language does not actually just name the word, it redefines our relationship to the word. And it is not accidental that the nomenclature has been changed uh, deliberately. So I think that the market becomes the primary producer, I'd say, of cultural logic and value. And I think it frames how we think, therefore, about education. And 
Education is on the market. And I want to come to this because a lot of people do not look at uh, wider global policy at the macro context. One of the most significant things that was noted by the European Central Bank in 2006 was the declining return to manufacturing and agriculture in Europe. That has also been noted at World Bank level, and there has been a major move to create a market for the sale of services, including the sale of education and health. That is not some thought of a conspiracy on the behalf of people who are left wing, it is a matter of public policy in Europe. And indeed in the countries, even the UK may not define itself as European, we know that debate, but it is also part of that politics. And I'm just saying here, there is a global movement under the WTO, the World Trade Organization, to actually make education, especially higher education, into a tradable service, and rather than a public service. And a lot of people don't recognize the fact, for example, even a country like Pakistan, which nationalized its education system in 1974 and made primary education free, etc., has reversed that decision and has actually made primary education contingent of pay in a number of uh, parts of the country and in certainly in rural areas it is having a designating effect. So I'm just saying this notion of moving education from a public to a private service on a pay as you go basis is a major issue. It's a major issue mostly in higher education at the moment, but I certainly think. Um, it's certainly in the South, for example, we have just my own university, most people don't realise that, we had a meeting last week and we were informed by the bursar, the head of finance, that, for example, at the moment only 50% of our income comes from the exchequer. 50%. It was 85% about 10 to 12 years ago. That is privatisation. That is what it is. So I'm just saying that that, I think, is a big issue. And it is not an issue that is just at the, it comes at several levels. Not just education uh, going on the market, but education for the market. Because the OECD, 2020, the Euro 2020 plan, education is defined as actually, as I say there, actually meeting labour market needs. Now I'm not condemning that, I think we have to do that, but that is stated to be its primary purpose. And what I think is happening is a lot of the major international, multilateral institutions employ soft rhetoric uh, to actually exercise hard decisions and hard controls. So Antonio Novo talked about it, about governing without being seeming to govern. For example, as you probably know, in Europe, education is governed by what's called the open method of coordination, which in theory means that states have autonomy and how they discern and how they determine education policies, and they do. But they are also subject to government by measurement, by PISA, by lead tables, by rankings, by key performance indicators. So even though we have autonomy, at another level, we don't have autonomy, and there is a new form of governance, no matter in what guise it may appear, uh, that is actually controlling and market orienting what we do. Um, as I said here, uh, including is a goal of neoliberal capitalism. I don't think anybody who reads the papers of the WTO, I'll just take a quote from it there. Education should be viewed as a commodity rather than as a consciousness raising experience. That is our radical redefinition of the purpose of education. And what I'm saying is that this ideology and the undermining of education as a public good in the media and politics is crucial to legitimating costs. It's part of this way it's happening systematically in the South. And I would have critiques of my own or professionals, which I'll come to in a moment, including educationists. But there is a whole manifestation of this, the rise of for-profit education, break-even, voluntary contributions, self funds through charity, links with commercial bodies, are all symptoms of how public education is being undermined. And I would ask though, have we, us, responsibility? And because when we talk about neoliberalism, there's a, often a tendency among educationists to say it's somebody else out there, it has nothing to do with us. There's no doubt that the regulation and control of professionals is a major object of the new managerial project. Uh, teachers were seen to have too much power, uh, nurses were seen to have too much power, especially professionals in the public sector. That is true. And there is a major power struggle going on over who has power within the public sector. But I think we need to be reflexive and ask ourselves, are we partly responsible for our own uh, demise and certainly for the challenges to ourselves? For example, we do have agency as teachers, as academics, as professionals. And uh, for example, as I would say here, 
who benefits. There is no question about it. There are certain people who benefit greatly from the new managerial project. Uh, people who are extremely competitive, people who are able to turn education into certain areas of research that will be funded by private business and the state, people who are prepared to offer courses that are market-led do benefit in the new managerial project. We are not homogenous. Uh, and I think that that's something we have to admit. And also, even as somebody who is a member of a trade union all my life, I sit to, I don't think we have to ask ourselves questions about, you know, how did we reflect before the crisis? Are, only, are we only reflecting on our own relative privilege because of the crisis? I think that is a very serious question for professionals. Um, and I think that we have to ask ourselves, had we agency in, in this process? For example, and I come up to it here, yes, the American, 9% of higher education students are now in for-profit universities in the United States. But we have our own. We have the corporate education, it's global. We have Kaplan, the Cato Institute of Apollo, the Dublin Business School is owned by Kaplan. It's a subsidiary of the Washington Post. It's 6,000 students. But Hibernia College, which is a for-profit provider, is the largest single provider now, I think, on an annual basis, of primary school teachers. To my knowledge, it was set up by people who were educated and paid for in the public sector. So I think we need to stop deluding ourselves that everybody who's in the public sector is virtuous and everybody who's in the private sector is bad. Because there's a massive rise, for example, at the moment in the care of the elderly, I just take this, uh, of people setting up a care of businesses. Mostly people who have been in the public sector who are setting up for-profit businesses and employing a lot of migrant workers at very low wages in order to set up a business. So I do think we need to be honest and ask ourselves what role have we played in this process and you know, do we challenge and how do we challenge this development within ourselves. I want to talk about, I suppose, the core of this, how it influences Neoliberalism is about adopting business models of operation uh, and to institutionalizing them in the, in the systems of public service. That is what the new managerial project is. So you move from being a center of learning <coughs> and care for children and young people and schools to a center of service delivery with productivity targets. And I think this legitimates, this whole culture legitimates the pursuit of self-interest, and credentialism among students and career interests among staff. And of course, uh, there's a correlate of this, which is proletarianization, because once you start to move to the idea of something that's self-sustaining economically, clearly certain areas of education are not self-sustaining and never will be. And that is, for example, we have not got the figures for the South, but, so I can't quote them, but I am 100% sure that I would the figures are no better than they are for the UK in terms of the number of academics who are now on fixed term contracts. So we have a proletarianization. It hasn't happened at primary and secondary level to the same degree, but we do have, I think, the people here from the IMTO and the ASTI, if they're here, well, the TUI will know that the same trend is there. There is a casualization and a two tier uh, career system. And we have to ask ourselves who made this up? Wasn't it the teacher unions themselves who agreed to it? So I think we need to be honest and say, were we protecting our own privileges and what were we doing to young people, um, young people who enter the professions? Um, and I think there is an, a, a diminishing of idealism when in fact the whole goal of the enterprise becomes the career, the ideology of the career progression and success. Um, I think the vulnerable become a nuisance. That is quite frankly what I think they are, because no school often wants to take, I know you have, we're going to have new admissions in the South, not before time, but it's still going to allow people to select, I believe, I, I read the act the other day, the bill the other day, but I couldn't see any reference to it on the basis of uh, having past pupils, which I totally disagree with, of course. Uh, but I'm just saying, admissions, everything is, how can you not have disadvantaged students, because they will bring down your KPIs, your key performance indicators. And there is another dimension to this, which is the knowledge economy. And I decided to take up this theme because I decided to have a reread of what we call Fort Smith, which was a report that led to all the cuts in education and public services. Part of the whole ideology of the neoliberal era is that we're going to have a knowledge economy. Every country in Europe is talking about having a knowledge economy. Is it really what we have? And 
Is this just a means? I'm asking the question of justifying state investment in science and technology whose ultimate beneficiaries are actually the private sector. I take this quote here because nobody has ever highlighted it from the <coughs> McCarthy report, as it was known as it was on state expenditure and, and uh, numbers in the public sector. But it says, as it says here, although spending in science technology as promoted as a key element of public policy in the South, the evidence is that that investment in terms of actual economic activity has not been very compelling. Right? But what has happened? They point out, for example, that at least 20% of new doctorate students in this area went overseas, emigrated, and those who remain most find employment in the public rather than the private sector. I ask this because I do think we are not allowed to have a debate about the amount, the, the myth that at times I think is there in relation to the so-called knowledge economy. One of the most recently, I don't know if you're familiar with the book Class Dismissed uh, uh, in the United States from John Marsh, who's a professor of English, but he's written it in, it's mainly a statistical book, an economics book, where he's involved in an education one. But it is about how, in fact, we have a massive ride in a low-wage service economy. And there is a myth being perpetuated that the vast majority of people will somehow, within a given nation state, actually get employment that is high-tech, etc., etc. But I'm glad to see the figures. And there was supposed to be in the South a study telling us what proportion of our graduates who have done all these PhDs, all of which are funded by the Exchequer, and where they are and what they're doing, it is not materialized. And part of this whole ideology as well is fed into what is the notion of the war for talent. McKinsey and company, who are global consultants, developed this whole idea in their book, The War for Talent, uh, in 1997. And I think it's part of the ideology, the goal is creating elites. I don't know if you've read, um, what you call him, the founder of Microsoft. He's written this whole thing about, you know, we have to have A, B, and C employees, and the A's are rewarded, the B's are told to improve, and the C's are told to leave. And that is a whole ideology that's very strong. And now we have a global market, which we have with globalization of capital and the localization of, of employees, uh, for those, except for those who are highly skilled. You have this whole development of the idea of the elite graduate. And it feeds into the idea of the elite table uh, universities, which feeds into the idea of the elite tables. But the whole idea behind it, of course, is to create an ideology of scarcity of talent and reward people very highly who are part of this global, whether it's in finance or whether it's in uh, computing science or whatever. And uh, what I'm saying is that whole ideology is very deep-seated in our culture. It has become very deep-seated that there is a scarcity of talent. And uh, what of course, the whole thinking behind it says, and I've heard this in public fora, why should we pay for graduates in the universities? After all, they're going to immigrate to other countries. Why should we bother? And certainly in our own Jewish part of this island, there has been a rise of what we call merit, merit, merit scholarships, Trinity, UCD, Cork, all of they all, they all have them. And at the same time, access programs and everything have really been let, in my view, go by the wayside, the higher education. Um, a uh, targeted initiative has been mainstreamed, which is a nice and polite way of saying it has been closed down. Another aspect of this whole development, which is eroding, especially in higher education, is the move uh, from financial and uh, to public and private partnerships as a substitute for state investment, where in fact a project or something, unless it is immediately beneficial in commercial terms. Um, and what we have now is uh, foundations, we have our own honor justifying it and many others, saying we will pay our taxes through charity. But of course charity is extremely dangerous. It, first of all, people determine the conditions on which you will get money and they often determine what exactly you will do. And you have what I call, uh, it was called philanthropic capitalism, with not just control over the public sector in education, but in my view, most seriously, we have absolutely hardly any funding now for civil society, community, education in the South. And what we do have is you are told to apply to, they're closing down by the day, the Wound Foundation is closing down, Ryan Ayers Foundation, uh, Atlantic Philanthropies is closing down, 
So we will have no civil society, public education or adult education descent because uh, of the terms and conditions that the state can put down often, which is that they will only fund that type of education which is market relevant. And also at the area of research. Because again, this move to public-private partnership, partnership with business, it's in absolutely every university uh, manual and schedule and mission in relation to research. Not a bad idea. But I do think one of the dangers with it is that it is uh, the elision of the difference between public interest and private interest. Uh, there is a very big difference between research which is completely detached and not tied to an interest body and research which is funded by a foundation that is tied to a commercial body. Because over time, no institution that is commercial is going to fund research which will undermine their own share price. And yet, we have no debate about that. And it is a very serious issue in relation to science, research, and education. So I'm saying that is at the macro level. That is the context globally of what is happening. And of course, to institutionalize it, we have the new managerial project at the meso level of operation of neoliberalism. And I would argue that how it has been introduced, and certainly what we have found in humanitarianism in the book, is the technical changes were introduced, often in soft language, but they were imbued with market values. And as I said here, it is a very politicized form of governance, mark masquerading as neutral. And I'll just take a few points, for example, that are very much part of it that was raised in the research. That people talked about how mission matters now. That your focus is on your image and your fabrication of yourself, both institutionally for your school or your university, and if you're an academic, for, your, your, for yourself as an individual in terms of your citations. So you have a whole gaming industry developed by the individuals, colleges, <coughs> and bit around PR. And a lot of school principals in particular talked about how a lot of their time had to be spent doing good PR for their schools rather than actually maybe focusing on what matters the most, which is attentive to the children in their school. And I think as well, when you alter the relationship to one to customer, where it happens, it is a market service, and you're expected to deliver. You're expected to deliver that service, and somebody is expected to get what they pay for. And again, that is a radical altering of the relationship within education, especially in higher education. And I just think it's obvious, competition between a service of individuals is now seen as a virtue. I think competition is part of life. We've lived in a world of finite resources. But competition is not necessarily virtuous, although it has been made into a virtue. And being businesslike, uh, this came up especially where people, one of the couple of institutions were involved in further education and that we interviewed in, and they talk about how there are certain types of education is not funded anymore. Community education, uh, in schools, for example, major cutbacks in career guidance, and a major onslaught, in my view, especially in the critical disciplines in the humanities and social sciences. Um, lack of funding, a lack of support for them, and of course we have the position now where poor EU students are being replaced by fee-paying non-EU students, especially at graduate level, and especially in the South, where we have taken away, what I think is a desperately retrograde step, the maintenance grants that students who were on state grants were guaranteed for a master's degree. So it also is a culture of authoritarianism, and this was very evident from the research in relation to higher education. You had the charade of consultation, uh, many, many committees, meetings, etc. But people talked about how that, that actually did not often translate into actual implementation of decisions, etc., because the decisions were often already made. So you have responsibility without power, uh, and you have governance without control. You have responsibility for it. And as I said, an addition between the difference between private, private and public funding, private and voluntary, edu uh, private and voluntary education. And I definitely think that's a very serious issue because uh, I'm not saying that, and this is where I go back, I do think as professionals we have to be reflexible about what our own faults were and how we ran the public service. Were we truly democratic? To whom were we accountable? Inequality in education was not new, is not new to the liberalism it existed beforehand. I would take, for example, in the South, something that absolutely shocked me is 
1998 legislation, the Education Act, had a committee set up which was to monitor education disadvantage. That was abandoned within 2005. There was no debate about that. The committee was just closed down. <coughs> and I have to say, I didn't hear shouts from many professional educators about that. We still have no data in the South, which I believe we should have, on public examinations by social class, race, ethnicity, etc. I don't know how many letters I've written. I don't know how many reports I've seen telling us that we would have that next year. We still haven't got it. And I think those who are part of the, under the 1998 legislation and the universities, the 1997 legislation, I think we have to ask, our, and for our, the IOTs, I think it was slightly uh, different here, we have to ask ourselves, why did we not fight for those? So what I would see as most problematic is that we're reconstituting the education price. Uh, we are making the value of the human being tied to performance. Somebody asked me the other day if I had a metaphor or an image for what I would represent education. I said, it would now be human life is being reduced to a measuring tape. From the time you enter to the time you leave to when you work, you are measured constantly. Constantly, constantly measured. And it's tied to performance. And it even change, is evident in the change of the nomenclature from something like unemployment assistance, take that, which is what you got if you couldn't get a job. Now, in the South, it's called job seekers allowance. That implies that you are not entitled to welfare from the state unless you are looking for a job. That is a fundamental shift in culture of who is valued in the state. You are not allowed to be unemployed. You have to get a job. Your citizenship is increasingly contingent on your performance. And there's also the developing of the actuary itself and the location of risk within the individual. If we remove supports like guidance counsellors, for example, from schools, then you must calculate your own risk. You must set up your own agenda. You must manage your own life. So you develop the actuary itself. And of course, the actuary itself, by definition, is a self-referential self, because you have to be, because your survival depends on it. And I would say here, there's a declining interest in many groups in society. Uh, we've seen by numerous attempts to cut uh, education supports for special needs assistance, and only reversed in the case of, uh, of, of these cases because you have a large middle class body of parents who are able to shout politically. But most people here don't know there's an over 80% cut to the grants to education for travellers in the South in the last two governments, the current one and the previous one. That is outrageous. They are the group who have most education disadvantage, but they don't have political clout. Immigrants, uh, for example, there's a cut to the second language support and the number of teachers you could get. Again, a group who can't speak out. So I think that this neoliberal project and uh, its translation into practice is very real. It is actually about power and it's about uh, attending to, in my view, uh, the elites in society. But it also impacts on staff. We're all subject to surveillance. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't be democratic accountable, but democratic accountability and I, is different to market accountability. And I suppose what I would say is maybe this is where we fell down professionally. For many, many years, people resisted any accountability. And because of that, we have accountability of a new form imposed on us. And I think, therefore, for example, you have a lot of cultural shifts. I certainly noticed it in the university and people in higher education in our interviews talked about the politics of envy, how, in fact, when everything is up front, surveillance up on your website, you know, every lesser thing you ever do is referred to in public, uh, you have this whole culture of self-display, fabrication, and, of course, competition. And I think those who can pay can hold the system to account. Those who can't pay won't hold the system to account. And I think what I've cited in relation to travellers and immigrants is a good example. I just mentioned here these, because this is the way we're held to account at a collective level, and I've just circulated a paper which can be made available to this. I just mentioned this, because we're all subject to this in universities. But unbelievably, I have only 24 hours of the day no academics, and maybe this is where I'm at fault myself, I hope to do one, an article on this for the newspapers, but I've just written an academic one. But these deep tables, okay, they influence us, we know they influence the market, but they're not scientific, they're unrepresentative, etc. But yet, how have we contested them in public, despite our private knowledge of their unscientific character? 
have we contested? You know, I'm just saying, there is a whole question of Thompson Scientific and is it Elsevier and the two big commercial bodies that control journals, having themselves, of course, benefiting greatly by people being evaluated on the basis of journals. <laughs> and yet these are the people who prepare the indices. Surely <coughs> bit of goodness, that kind of issue needs to be highlighted in the conflict of interest actually adverted to a point. And I suppose what I'm talking about here, which I think is really problematic in relation to human beings, whether they're children or staff or whoever, is the tyranny of numbers. Rank ordering has a semblance of objectivity. And I think there is a myth in numbers that what can be hierarchically ordered can be, as I say here, incontrovertibly judged. Just because you can order things in rank order by number does not mean that it is truthful or a fair or reasonable account of what has been achieved. And ranking league tables have that status. Uh, they create, in my view, what they purport to serve. They create self-fulfilling prophecies because, of course, people actually, the schools, we've seen it in the UK, and maybe not so much in Northern Ireland, I don't know, but certainly from what I do read, you have a whole new culture that is created around you. And you have a constant state of measuring yourself psychologically up and down. And I don't think that's good for people's mental health. I really don't. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be democratically accountable. I've done surveys all my life with my students, etc., like many other people have. But there is a difference between that and having every single thing that you do monitored in public. And of course, what we have now actually in higher education is individualized capitalism, where you can become a star, you market yourself, you know, you can get more money, you can get a higher wage, you can sell yourself. And of course, that's what I'm saying. There are people who gain in the new managerial project. And many of those who get into power are people who play the game and who do game. So I'm not saying everybody is, but I think it is something we need to adapt. And they're stressing it all up in injustice and soft talk, uh, restructuring, innovation, lifelong learning, uh, the languages of efficiencies and advancement. Uh, and I'm just saying, so any going forward, moving on, the, all the EU language of modernizing, modernizing schools, modernizing universities. And there is a serious attack on the dissenter. You know, I often think, remember, Catholic, Protestant, and dissenter. I wonder where the dissenters have gone. Because they're very important people at this time. Even things like secure wages and living conditions for people are now defined as luxuries. We're told that people in the public service shouldn't have secure wages or, or pensions. That is an outrageous suggestion. Because, in fact, anybody who knows the looks at the demographics of this part, of the, both parts of the island, actually, knows that if we don't have proper pension schemes into the future, we're going to have huge poverty in old age. So I'm just saying we have all the language of interference, the nanny state, which I think is a word to deconstruct itself. A, it's sexist because it implies that women who are old are somehow you know, undesirable people because they care for others. B, it's ageist, because it implies that older women are actually unsuitable and an unsuitable model in which we might manage the state. And that whole language is there, it is used at nauseam, certainly in the South, and often it is not challenged. So I'm just saying, a lot of it is, there is a whole ideological play that is going on where we dress up, uh, restructuring, modernizing, um, regenerating. That's a word I really love because I was involved with the St. Michael's House in the State of the South and John Bissett and others are writing their book. You don't regenerate poverty. Somebody who actually is in a housing estate who has no job and who's poor is poor whether they're in a new housing estate or not. But this language gives the impression that something has been done. And I think that we, that is certainly, in my view, one of the areas we have to challenge what's happening. I have no doubt that this will we exacerbate, but I will not romanticize the past. That's what I think there's a danger of doing. We cannot romanticize. For example, the universities were always hierarchical. In my experience, they were also patriarchal, extremely so in my own experience. And so I think that it isn't that everything was romantic in the past, but I think the rate we're going towards the future is one where it would be an exacerbation of inequality. Because, of course, if you judge by measurable performance, certain people are not going to perform as well as others, often not least due to lack of resources. And <clears throat> so, but I would say here there is also another culture, which is partly what a lot of this book is about, which is a culture of what I call carelessness, especially in higher education. But in fact, it was an issue 
that especially school principals had set it down with the South approach. There was so much emphasis on performance and management of image, etc., and addressing even league tables that, um, that newspapers create, although we don't have them officially, that the rules of teaching and, uh, and learning had changed in their transaction in that culture. And that they themselves, to be an ideal school principal, or we call them, I think, maybe a head teacher, you have to be 24-7. Uh, and what I think is so, again, the concept of the citizen that is underpinning that is that, of course, you have no dependency needs, that you don't have anybody dependent on you, and that you are able to live a completely autonomous life. And I think that that is also there implicit, if that's the role model we give to children in school, then that is the ideal type person to be. And, but I don't think it's, you can measure care in the PPI. I just took some of the quotes. These three women are, still are, are one, extremely senior people in Irish higher education in the South. And this is what they talk, these are some of the quotes from the book. Talking about having, uh, this first woman talked about having a third child. And she just said, like you can read it there, I don't need to read it out to you, but she said, I determined no more children. I couldn't cope with it when she went back after, she was breastfeeding after a second child. I just couldn't, she said, because people simply didn't understand. And I needed a cup of tea or a glass of water or something when I was at a meeting because she was still breastfeeding. There was just no culture and she was expected to act like as if she had no care needs or no dependent children. I would argue that it isn't just senior women, these are the people interviewed. Uh, the second woman talked about her own herself having only one child because she said, I would never get tenure if I had a second. How many PhD students, for example, uh, are told, you know, don't get pregnant, you, you know, it'll kill your career, especially women. So I think that there is a whole culture that has developed um, that around the notion of what constitutes the successful scholar, uh, the successful manager, and it is, in my view, a very careless conception of the person. And this last woman said she didn't have any children because to move into a senior position, it was just too difficult to think for one place to another. So I'm just saying there is a big gender dimension to managerialism. I know that people like um, Rosemary Dean and those have said it provides new opportunities for women in management. I think that is true. But often at a very high price. And often uh, for people, um, and certainly there's a lot of research in Australia showing a lot of women who went to senior positions either have, like the women I just spoke to, very few children or no children. And the men who went to the same position, because as I said, you have, you're expected to be what we call in the other book on affective equality, a care commander. Somebody who has uh, assigned your primary care work to low paid child care workers, generally because they're not very well paid and most precious, or to very poorly paid on pairs, if at all, or to somebody else, right? And there, that is the whole culture, not just, of course, in academia or in, but it is the culture on which we work, certainly in the South. And I think there is a big problem here because the whole concept that we have of the person that underpins that is that the person who runs schools and colleges and senior positions is somebody who has no dependence. And it reflects and goes back to the notion of the ideal citizen as a performing citizen in the public sphere who is materially productive for the economy. But our mental health and well-being and our emotional well-being is very much dependent on care, including care and education. And one of my PhD students, Maggie Feely, is bringing about a very interesting book which will be out, I think, next year called Learning and Care on studies she did with people who were in institutional care and how the lack of care in their lives from home to institutional care to school seriously damaged their learning. So I'm just saying, what I feel, I'll just finish up, is there's a danger of education in this whole culture being defined as a immoral practice, uh, where the issues of values are reduced to issues of technical reorganization. And my fear is, I suppose, and I don't want to be alarmist about it, but I think that language expunges certain issues from debate. Uh, uh, it expunges the question of equality issues at the most basic level, uh, except, uh, and I also think it expunges the whole language of care. And I would ask, I suppose, a question for you, a challenge. I think critically oriented scholars uh, need to recognize a very real threat to critical thinking and research. 
that there is at the moment, because certainly there is very little funding for anything. In fact, I was talking to people coming up with a train to Charlotte Holland and, and uh, Carmel, and I was just saying, I'm actually going to do a paper on uh, not getting funding, and why? <laughs> because I do think there, nobody is talking about that, and nobody is talking about the governance of our intellectual culture by, for example, Europe uh, 2020, whatever the next one is, I can't remember, what's the new program, is it Europe 2020? Yes. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, Horizons 2020. And I had a, one of these FP7, so I'm very, and an FP6, so I'm very familiar with Europe and I'm very familiar with it, but not, and I gather that people are writing with that, but I think it is a very serious question. What is actually, who is funding our research and why is certain research not being funded? And what I suppose Axel Honneth, he's director of the Institute for Social Science Research in Frankfurt, has written lately about, he's written a lot about equality, I suppose that's why I know his work, but he also has written lately about the importance of critical thinkers becoming public intellectuals. He said that in Europe, we need to go outside the walls of the university, we need to go outside the walls of our research institute, and we need to bring our knowledge, even if we don't get any credit for it in our career structure, into the public debate, in order to create a different kind of public debate. And I actually feel myself, I've often felt this, that the whole peer-reviewed system, because I know a lot of your academics are here, is of course inevitable. You have to fear you, I'm not denying that. But I think where the sole focus is on granting promotion and standing and status to people on the basis of particular journal articles or peer reviewed things alone, what you do is you silence people from engaging with the public. You don't do it intentionally, but you certainly do it indirectly. Because everybody focuses on their next academic output. And as I said to somebody, I think actually it was Leo Dowd here, who was originally here in Queens, who was talking to start a study on the social sciences and the number of citations on a given article, and is actually four people who actually read it, just in case you're flattering yourself. Um, and so I think what I'm saying is we need to critique the doctors of the academic trade and the conditions of our own knowledge production systems. And certainly, in my view, part of that means it's certainly in the equality area creating partnerships, creating dialogue. I wrote a paper on this a long time ago in 1999 in the Economic and Social Review. Um, with teachers, with civil society, with the people about whom we write. And I don't think, certainly, I was involved for a number of years with um, community groups, uh, certainly in St. Michael's State, which were, had been regenerated and all. But it was a very interesting experience. They're the only state who actually got funding to get their houses rebuilt. But well, we created an alliance with them in the university, and John Bissett wrote his book, Regeneration, Public Good and Private Profit. And it was, a pub, it was the community itself claiming their voice from that area that actually forced the government to build those houses. It wasn't academics. And that's what I'm saying, is I think that academics need to start to rethink. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with the debate about remote one and remote two epistemologies and the importance of experiential knowledge. But I definitely think that in order to have a transformative effect, which I know some of you are very interested in, I think we also have to think of our relationship as public intellectuals, but also as partners in research and in what we do. And I would see that as a way of challenging, in a very organized way, in a very slow way, because it is slow, but it is, in my view, something that we need to do if we're to challenge what is happening in public education. Thank you very much. Thank you.